Welcome everybody to the inaugural Macro Mindset webinar. Uh, my name is Tyler Yale. I am a, a trading instructor and currency analyst with Daily FX, and, and today we're going to be focusing on a, a passion of mine, which is quite simply the macro themes. Uh, we we will dive in really to uh, not only the key news events, but also what's going on in the rates market, commodities market, um, and, and how that's affecting the currency markets as well. Uh, naturally, these are all uh, correlated markets and, and that's really a key focus to this session is that intermarket correlation continues to, to to build up to extremes and that's just a that's just a matter of the environment that we trade in nowadays uh, and, and quite simply uh, the, the technology with which markets are based on so um, that being said let me get to uh, Arista Disclaimer's uh, front just some housekeeping points so we can get on with the show Arista Disclaimer states that trading on a margin carries a high level of risk and may not be suitable for all investors the high degree of leverage can work against you as well as for you uh, I'll leave this up for a few moments uh, also just to let you guys know this session is being recorded. I'm going to hit you with a lot of information, uh, which is which is my modus operandi. I like to uh, I like to pack in as much information as possible, uh, and, and you know five or ten percent of it might be readily applicable to you, um, and but but hopefully you, know, you can get the value of that other you know, eighty ninety percent um, at, at a different time if you want to rewatch it. Um, I'll, uh, let me get to the uh, the next disclaimer, um, and, and I'll just leave that up for a few seconds. Uh, I'll tell you my hack. There's a um, there is a, uh, and I'm not sure if it's if it's default in the YouTube or if it's an ad and I, I put on Chrome, uh, but I'll often uh, basically speed up videos. So that's a way that I can you know watch the same thing a couple times and and get more information. So um, it, you know either if you rewatch it, it's going to be loaded to YouTube after this, and that's what I'll be I'll be emailing you guys the link. Uh, I'll be emailing you guys the slide, and of course, if you have any questions, you can reply to email by me. But uh, that's a way that I'm able to uh, basically ingest more information in, in, in a fixed period of time is by speeding up the videos that I take in. Uh, here is my contact information. Uh, by all means, do not hesitate to reach out to me, please. Uh, again, we're going to be covering a lot of information. We're going to be talking about a lot of markets and and how what's happening in some markets could affect uh, could affect possibly some trades you're in. And so, uh, with that, it's it's going to be important to uh, to make sure you have a clear understanding of, of what to watch for. Um, and so that's that's definitely something that I encourage you to reach out to me about uh, after uh, either after the session or if you have live questions, by all means, uh, please do. Uh, so so what is the overall objective? I've touched on it a few times, but really the key thing we're looking at. Um, is, is what's going on in key financial markets across the world, uh, specifically rates or fixed income, uh, commodities, and currencies. Uh, and, and naturally, when it when it be able to find themes that are affecting your trades. Uh, you've likely heard, if you've joined me in other webinars before, uh, I talk about that themes are a difficult thing to build a trade alone on. And, and really what I'm getting to when I say that in those other webinars and what I'm, what I'm getting to right now uh, is that it's helpful to have a technical trigger. Uh, in fact, if you look at like our analyst pick, uh, Chris Vecchio has a has a dollar yen long analyst pick, and he's using Nikkei long or a breakout higher in the Nikkei, which seems to be developing. We'll actually take a look at that in a little bit uh, as a confirmation point. Uh, Ergo, it's nice to have the technicals as a confirmation point to some of these technical themes. However, technical themes in and of themselves, uh, I, I think that that's 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 from a prior era in, in terms of being. A, being a good trade, uh, it's just taking a theme and putting a trade on naturally, um, it's it's always helpful. I think to have that technical th that technical trigger or confirmation, whatever you want to call it, to get into a trade. Obviously, obviously, technicals can be tricky, and and sometimes it feels like five percent of the technical signals are true, uh, ninety five percent of them are, are head fakes or whatever you want to call them. Um, but all that being said, we're going to be looking at themes here that could possibly bring about trades. But it's it's nice to have quite simply some confirmations or uh, looking for technical significance that that brings that trade into effect. So what what are we going to be taking a look at? Uh, of course, we're going to be first focusing really on uh, the major the major locations which from a markets perspective you know we'll look at uh, North America Europe and Asia for the week ahead uh, and obviously the headline is F FOMC which is piggybacking on the surprisingly hawkish ECB last week started off dovish finished off hawkish um, but in, in addition to that we also have uh, a handful of central bank announcements in uh, in, in Europe this week Norges Bank is actually probably going to steal the show from SNB and BOE um, and we'll talk about that a bit and then we're going to get our hands dirty with with the, those macro those the, those macro markets which again rates commodities and currencies uh, and I'm, I'm even going to bring ETFs into it because if you use a program like I like to use which is a trading view 
uh, you can utilize ETFs to get a handle on sentiment and what are some of the themes that are going on. Uh, that, that the thing that's nice, and I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this quote, but to paraphrase uh, Tudor Jones, Paul Tudor Jones, you know, he talks about how global macro is basically a, a, a snapshot of capital flow around the world and seeing where money is traded. And I think ETFs also give you the ability to do that, looking at global ETFs. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand pick some of the ETFs that I like to look at. And again, the idea behind this webinar and, and most of the webinars I do is, is to really kind of open up the garage door and, and show you the tools that I'm working with, show you how I use them uh, and, and show you how to use them as well. Nothing that I'm really going to show you here uh, is is uh, going to stay behind the, the, the chest pocket, so to speak. It's all going to be available for you uh, and, and naturally if you have questions on how to use them, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, so I've, I've also mentioned some of this before as well, but why global macro? This, this to me is an important slide because I think it's helpful to note. I think it can be uh, difficult especially as you're building a strategy, which on Wednesday I'm going to have a webinar on, on actually you know, strategy development and understanding some of the, uh, the, not only the psychology, but the practicality of, of building out a strategy, a trading strategy. Uh, but I think when, when a trader comes into the market, it's helpful to know what's going on in other markets as well because, again, those can be signals or triggers uh, to what could be affecting trades that they're in or trades they're watching. Uh, but, but the key thing to note is that intermarket correlation is extremely high high right now. Uh, and that's something that we could continue to see and, and really don't expect to diverge. The reason why, of course, uh, is, is because what's happening in Asia is very accessible to me uh, in a way it has not been historically. And so what's what's happening in quite simply like base metals and, and because of what's happening in Asia can affect an Aussie dollar trade, uh, which, which can affect the RBA, which can affect other things. So all, all that being said, you do have just just quite simply due to the increase of market coverage and increase in quite simply intermarket correlation. Intermarket correlation, as you can see there, just basically means rates affect FX, which the, the, the most notable story, if I had to pick out a story from rates, um, would probably be the, the breakout higher in, in Bund yields, German yields, uh, also a breakdown in, in, in the rate price of, of Bunds. Um, and with that, quite simply, we've seen support under the euro, uh, which is definitely one to watch. Again, I mentioned how the ECB basically kind of started off dovish and then finished off hawkish at their, their their meeting last week, uh, but all that being said, rates affect FX, right? Commodities affect stocks. Um, FX affects commodities, and, and, and because of that, I think it's it's helpful to to keep an eye on this. And naturally, you know, those of you that are watching Yellen and Co. Um, know that it seems like they're basically just a grabbing sentiment from the stock market as a reason to 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 trigger their their normalization cycle, um, and so. And that's been the fascinating conversation of late, which we'll talk a little bit about today. But you know, is it possible that we could see four hikes, um, you know, this year or next? Uh, and and so, and a, a lot of that has to do with the, um, to, to to use a phrase about the S and P, uh, soci the societal mood barometer, um, with with equities at all time high, it kind of gives the Fed that you know that that backing, so to speak, which you know, from a from an actual absolute economic perspective, may or may not be sound, but might be using the equity market as a reason to hike rates, which again is going to affect rates, which is going to affect FX. So you can see how that all goes around. Um, but the, the, the other thing that I think is, is very helpful to look for, and by definition, these are more rare, um, but is looking for, for market disconnects. When you see divergence, when you see uh, something starting to lead, uh, and it could be a lead or a lag, and sometimes it takes time to confirm that, but that's, that's an important component as well. Uh, and then always we'll be looking for technical significance within these and that's where personally I like to pull in ETFs, I like to pull in other markets and see what's happening. Uh, by all means though, please do not hesitate to ask questions throughout. Uh, this is this is meant to be as interactive as possible. Again, I'm going to be I'm going to be feeding a lot of information uh, because this is kind of a, a lookout on the week ahead as well as that that macro mindset and I don't know if I've really defined that macro mindset, but it really is getting that view that all markets are connected. Especially those, those, uh, especially those, you know, quote unquote macro markets, which again I define as uh, rates, commodities, and FX. Uh, and and then, you know, quite simply, we have we have derivatives of those, which you could easily argue that the equity market is really just a derivative of the rates market. Um, you could you could argue that you know commodities is a derivative of of rates and of uh, of, of FX. Uh, all, all that being said. 
rates, commodities, and, and FX, I think if you can get a good grasp of that, you can start to look at, you know, to, to paraphrase or to use the quote from Wayne Gretzky, you know, I don't go to where the, huck, the puck is, I go to where the puck's going to be. That's kind of the idea of what we want to do here is we want to see what seems to be developing and, and where might the puck land, to use that hockey analogy, so that we can get set up on trades there and, and ideally be there to catch a breakout or for you value hunters kind of come in early uh, and, and try and place little bets on development developing themes. That way, if the trade pays off, it pays off big. If it doesn't, if you get stopped out, you get stopped out at a small loss relative to the reward you were seeking. And that's that's really what we want to be building. So that hopefully that kind of puts sense to to the uh, the macro mindset name. Uh, so the week ahead, uh, obviously, again, we do have a, a central bank bonanza um, to, 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 to use a uh, an overused <laughs> word, uh, FOMC on Wednesday. Uh, that's going to be a big one. However, big one in the sense of people are going to be watching the press conference afterwards to get a hint on, you know, are they pushing forward to three? Could they possibly push forward to four? Um, I mean, the, the data has been just just outright solid uh, for the last really about six months. Um, if you look at the City Economic Surprise Index, which I don't I don't have a screenshot of that, um, but really since October uh, it's it's been bottom left to top right uh, it's been a, it's been a very impressive run and we're going to take a look at again uh, some other ETFs and other international equity markets that show that push higher in sentiment uh, the other thing naturally that it really is going to get a lot of attention I think um, and you know here's the, here's the thing so the G20 leader summit in Baden-Baden um, it, it's something that could have dramatic effects in, in policy making specifically in Japan uh, but it's also possible that as we see with politics that you know well, that's not always the case. People are polite. They say their kind words, kind of like we're seeing in the, in the uh, we saw in the Sierra Week, um, which was the energy conference in Houston last week. Uh, it's ironic, quite simply, that you had uh, heads of OPEC, you know, who have been cutting production uh, and, and trying to st stabilize the market, uh, basically on the home turf of U.S. shale producers who are overproducing, which quite simply led to that dramatic pullback in the oil market. All that being said, um, you have these environments where sometimes people are polite, like they were in the Sarah week, even though, again, U.S. oil producers could be drowning the oil market, pulling us back into a, a mini 2014-2015 drop um, to be seen, right? Uh, but at the other hand, we, we could get a, a, a pretty dramatic change of course from that global free trade. Um, and and if we if we do in fact see something from the G20 leaders summit that uh, and, and we'll talk about this in more detail later, but it's just it's just worthy to note this weekend this basically this coming weekend, if we get anything that talks about uh, whether it's whether it's uh, protectionists or whether it's um, monetary policy uh, focused on limiting intervention, that could really that could really put a stumbling block, a high hurdle in front of Japan and the, and the FX intervention they've done via the yield curve control uh, and, and could make it a good deal more difficult for them. So the G20 Leader Summit has not gotten the attention I think it deserves due to FOMC, the recent ECB, what's going on with the Dutch, election, Dutch elections, excuse me, upcoming French elections. Um, but that's something that could could provide a stumbling block and that's often what trading is or that's often what macro is is it, it's kind of looking at the minefield and saying uh Barton Barton so <laughs> thanks um, uh, thank you DB DB and welcome DB good to have you by the way um, uh, but in in this uh, in in this uh, in, in this in this environment, I think it's looking around and saying, okay, what's potentially not being priced in right now that could have a dramatic effect? I think that G20 leader summit is one to keep an eye on. Uh, obviously, you know, we're not going to get, and, and I think as recent as an hour or two ago, uh, Fast FT, Fast Financial Times came out and said, listen, it's going to be the last week of March. It's not going to be this week that we'll get the Article 50 triggered. Um, basically need the, the Dutch elections first, but um, with with that, with that, um, I would I would just kind of come in. I would just come in and say it's it's worth keeping an eye on the G20 election, uh, the G20 leader summit. Excuse me, um, because that has the potential to royal markets that's not getting the attention it deserves. All right, this is just a snapshot of the daily FX economic calendar here. Main thing I want to show you: <laughs> there's a lot of red. Red means a high importance event. Has the ability to move the market. The, the, the way we've often seen markets move of late is basically flatline volatility followed by shocks if there is a surprise or a se severe disappointment. Uh, if there's not, again, I think just the nature of 
quite simply the quantitative driven markets and model driven markets is that naturally these models are working to price in or to identify mispriced assets and then and then quite simply bring those back in equilibriums. While trends do develop on the tails, right, those very strong or those very weak currencies uh, or, or those those opportunities where, macro, where the macro environment is supporting it or, or, or bidding it down, uh, I think you have an I think you have an environment where uh, naturally when you have higher higher quantity of high significance news events, you do have that potential for uh, you do have that potential to come in and say, okay, let let's see if let's see if we do get some shocks here. All right, with that, let's go to. North America. So again, Wednesday is really going to be the, the, the key day. Obviously, last Friday we had NFP pretty much down the line. So things are looking good there, which which opens up again, basically a hundred percent priced in or implied probability rate hike from the Fed. Again, what's 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 going to catch the attention is the post conference from Yellen, seeing whether or not there's there's any possibility of a fourth rate hike. Uh, we're going to take a look at two year yields. That's quite simply what a lot of people are looking at as a proxy for what the Fed could do. Um, you know, if if you look across the rate curve, you basically have two years being acting as acting as a proxy for what the Fed could do, uh, the, and the five-year yield acting as a proxy for what the new administration can do. Uh, so two-year yields are going to be an important one to watch. The CPI is coming out on Wednesday. Uh, it's likely to be discounted because it's coming out ahead of FOMC by a few hours. So not expecting too much action there. But let's let me go ahead and bring up, see if I can grab the DXY. And in fact, we'll take a look at both DXY and DXY and, uh, and and US two-year yields. So I'm going to just take off these. Uh, uh, these are from the technical analysis articles I write on dollar. Uh, so for the DXY, you can see here we're basically holding up the support line, and we're actually we're actually sitting at a pretty nice zone of support. Uh, this 102 zone has been nice resistance, and and with that, I think you do have an environment where you, you keep an eye on. While this trend has been choppy, does it remain higher? In fact, I'll, I'll be sharing with you guys a strong week in just a moment. Uh, but one thing we've seen is that we've really had uh, stability in both Europe and in uh, both Europe and in uh, the USD in terms of what's been what's been rather strong. In fact, last week I think you had uh, yen, euro, and dollar as basically the the top three strong currencies. Um, DXY net net, it's a strong trend, and so it's one that I think needs to come off before trying to get cute and shorting this market because it has so much support behind it. Uh, let's go from DXY to the US2 yield. Right, and what we've seen here is a recent breakout. In fact, uh, one thing that's been interesting, I don't have the 210 spread, uh, but quite simply, while while 10s have widened as well. Right. When you get that flattening between the two and the ten, which basically means the two yield has gone, the two-year yield has gone higher faster than the ten-year yield. That flattening is a encouragement for further risk taking. Basically, it means that people are. are, are Willing to take less of a premium to go further out in the curve, meaning basically there's a, there's a bit more encouragement on current risk sentiment, um, which naturally has implications for uh, for higher equity markets, despite being at all time highs, continue on higher. Uh, also has some further potential for uh, markets that are supported by higher yields, which could mean some either yen stability or yen weakness, uh, some dollar strength because that that implies again potentially more Fed action uh, and. And if Euro follows suit, some a more stable Euro. All right, and then you can see there just the other the other thing to note: we have some confidence surveys, which also have been doing rather well. Uh, but outside of that, you have a pretty quiet week ahead in terms of uh, in, in terms of uh, in, in terms of Canada. So uh, Canada, let me just let me bring that up. Really the commodity currencies have not been doing too much, uh, but it's, it's, worth, it's worth taking a look here. We, we pulled off a bit from the, uh, the dual employment report on Friday. Uh, we are sitting at resistance here. Uh, net net again. I think it's I think it's too early to build an aggressive short position. You know, I, th I'm, I'm, I imagine those little bets are going to be coming in. You know, people basically saying, okay, is this a, a triple top? Are we getting some type of resistance here? And 
I like to, my shortcut quite simply for looking at resistance is not a pure price point. Uh, I like to take a prior range, so what I like to call an extreme day price range. Let's see if I can get that there. Uh, and that's, that's basically what I'll do in terms of resistance. So for me, resistance isn't necessarily a price. Now if I'm using you know, Elliott Wave, then quite simply that will require a price. Uh, but in more general technical analysis, uh, I'll typically use a extreme day price range. That, and that's what I'm looking at here. So you can see there, it's basically this zone, which was acting as pretty nice resistance at the end of 2016. Uh, we've come to it again. However, if we break above it, that could make the argument that what we're about to see as a, a stronger break, basically to 38. And where I get 38 from would be the 618 of this overall zone. So uh, I, I say that to say this, there's not a lot fundamentally going on in Canada this week. However, if we do break above this range, this highlighted box here, uh, it could mean quite simply that we saw, uh, not, not to get too in depth with Elliott Wave, but is a you know, working on an A, B, and then a more aggressive move higher C, uh, which could be a 138.38.618 retracement or more extreme, uh, which naturally would, would align if we do get an oil breakdown. All right, let's go over to Europe. So Europe is where that central bank bonanza really comes out. That, that's the focus there, if you will. Um, so post ECB, I have Norwich's Bank, SMB, and the Bank of England. Uh, with that, quite simply, the question is gonna be, while the Norwich's Bank and, and Norway, the, the, with 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 the Norges Bank, quite simply, there has been positive economic developments, but it's going to be very very difficult to to ignore the pullback that we've seen in oil. Which, let me just pull that back up. Right. So the question I think is going to be, what gets the attention? Do, does oil get the attention, or does the recent does the recent run up in economic data get the attention? Um, naturally, it's going to be difficult for them to ignore oil, but it's also, I think, easier for them to say, listen, there's there's noise in the oil market. Uh, we've still seen an impressive rebound. So I, I think they could give, quite simply, though it's difficult to ignore oil, they could discount it and say, we, we anticipate this being just you know short-term noise in the oil market, uh, encouraged by the upside, encouraged by OPEC's action, uh, and, and, and quite simply, see a more hawkish Norges Bank, which, again, has the potential, uh, has the potential to uh, not only not only strengthen the knock, but be a be a bit of a boon to some of the other uh, some of the other scanty currencies. Um, the other thing, naturally, in terms of what will be watched, uh, is is whether or not whether or not we do start to see we do start to see um, you know quite simply uh, the rate shift focus. Uh, basically closer uh, from from the Bank of England. Uh, and then you can see here, Sweden releases inflation um, and quite simply uh, unemployment. So again, I think that that quite simply will be utilizing what we hear from the Norges Bank to, to affect how the market in really interprets uh, the, the release from the release from Sweden. All right, going over to Asia. Asia, again, I think this is, to me, uh, where an appropriate focus should be. So, of course, and let me just pull up here. We've had, on both ends of the spectrum, uh, we have had uh, a, a rather let's say stubborn, stubbornly weak Kiwi, uh, and and a, a somewhat resolute uh, or stalwart uh, Australian dollar. Australian dollars kind of div divided itself, if you will, from the CAD uh, and from and from the Kiwi, which have been which have been relatively weak over the last few weeks. All that being said, we do have AU confidence. Um, there definitely are some institutions that are saying that you know it's, we're going to have to see we're going to have to see something give, um, whether it is a, a further push higher in AU confidence uh, or a fallout in Kiwi data, which obviously we have GDP coming up. Uh, however, with Aussie Kiwi being so aggressively higher. It's, it's difficult to imagine that trend continuing without some type of pullback. Now, pullbacks are given in any trend, right? The question is, do we get that higher low followed by another push higher? Um, it, from, from what I've read, which again is, is you know, by definition going to be a rather small sample of what's out there, uh, institutions are, are, are not seeing that continuation for, uh, for upside in Aussie Kiwi without either a quite simply a, a nice move higher in base metals, which we're going to take a look at an ETF there that is doing rather well, um, a more hawkish RBA, uh, or quite simply, again, Kiwi data really starting to pull back. All right. With that, the other thing, um, you've got uh, BOJ holding monetary policy meeting. Um, the, the 
the thing that again I think is they're not expected to do to, to change anything at all. Again, I think the focus on uh, the G20 meeting, which is what I was mentioning earlier, uh, was was whether or not the statement "resist all forms of protectionism" will be removed. Which naturally, that again, not only does that put a hurdle in front of potential Japan intervention, uh, but also opens up the quite simply the blockade, if you will, to the international, like the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, and, and other international trade uh, j trade unions, so to speak. Um, you know, naturally, we've, we've heard a lot about NAFTA being renegotiated, um, you know, U.S. pulling out from the TPP. Uh, all, all that being said, if that phrase, resist all forms of protectionism, is removed, it does seem like that could, that could quite simply... Uh, uh, bring about an environment for a bit of risk off for the yen, which uh, for many of you that know, for those of you that don't, you know, typically a risk off event for the yen actually brings about repatriation of the yen. So institutions in Japan will typically sell their international holdings, basically buying back the yen to do so, holding cash, uh, and that, that tends to lead to a stronger yen. So uh, while we did get a push higher in dollar yen on Friday, let me bring that up. We did get this push higher. We, we are still sitting at this zone of support. And when I say zone of support, uh, or excuse me, zone of resistance, I'm going to do the same thing here. Again, this is really a simplified form of resistance, but what I like about it is that I've, I've, I've found it effective over the years uh, as a simplified form of resistance, basically saying, are we going to get to the point where this resistance turns into support? If so, we could be looking at a nice breakout. If this zone continues to hold us resistance, it, that, that could open up this, you know, kind of this drain of momentum, so to speak, uh, and drain of volatility that brings about the further downside or more stubborn yen strength. All right. So getting on to the macro markets, uh, rates naturally is the first first one to take a look at, and one of the one of the interesting things that has, has really developed, so to speak, over the last few uh, last few days, and naturally it's been longer than that, but it's gotten a lot of attention. Is quite simply the the push higher in bun yields or the breakdown in in, in uh, the bun rates. Um, what we've seen with that, quite simply, is stability in the euro, and that aligns quite simply with that hawkishness that we saw from Draghi on Thursday that surprised quite a few. Uh, all that being said, if we continue to see Bund yield breakouts or Bund yields higher, that seems to at least show, while maybe Euro USD upside may not be the most viable trade, we could be in an environment where you know, Euro Swiss remains supported, um, depending on what we get from uh, Euro SEC or, or from the Norges Bank, Euro Naki. Um, naturally, again, later this later this month, we're going to have uh, pound, uh, excuse me, Article 50 uh, anticipated to be, be released the last week of March. So Euro Pound could be supported. Uh, all, all that being said, I think you do have an environment where you have to sit back and say, okay, if that yield pushes higher, that bond yield pushes higher, it's going to be very difficult to get a a, a, a let's just call it a well-positioned short on the euro. Uh, it's something that a lot of people want to develop, but again, I think if, if that bond yield continues, uh, which just for what it's worth, this is going to be inverse, this is price, um, but if we continue to see a breakdown here, which I believe DB was looking at this as a head and shoulders, please correct me if I'm wrong, DB, uh, but if this continues to break down, if the price continues to break down, uh, or the yield, which is again going to be inverse of the price, pushes higher, that's going to provide some support for the euro, and you know, right now we are seeing across the G8, the euro basically as the strongest currency from an indexing program I run, which basically just takes four-hour charts, 28 different currencies, uh, and a 200-period moving average and says, okay, across the G8, 28 different pairs, which currency is above the respected 200-period moving average the most and which one is below the 200-period moving average the most, uh, and right now it's right now it's Euro-Kiwi. So, uh, excuse me, Euro is the strongest, so, sorry, I got ahead of myself, Euro-Kiwi is the strong weak pair. So, that means that Euro is above the respective 200 period moving average the most, New Zealand dollar is below the respective 200 period moving average the most. Um, so, that being said, that could provide further support. And thank you, DB, uh, let me just get that back. Uh, DB saying that I do think we could see a a, a break lower in bond futures as we roll to the June contract, uh, basically looking for a move down, uh, basically to, to this to this low or or lower. 
but he said the continuation chart looks uh, looks pretty ugly. Thank you, DB, for that. All right. The other thing on the rates, naturally, the uh, and, and this is a this is a chart that I'll share with you guys later uh, on the slides. But uh, one one chart I like to call the most interesting chart in the world because you know, quite simply, it's a lot. It's what a lot of fund managers are looking at. We've got the log scale on. So a lot of fund managers are looking at, and the question is, are we going to break out of this? multi-decade, because uh, this really goes back to the early 80s, this multi-decade bull market in rates, bear market in yields, uh, because if we do get that break out there, again, the, the, the question, and this was, uh, this was posed very well by uh, Julian of Macro Intelligence Partners um, in a Real Vision interview, and he basically said, listen, the Fed significantly failed their inflation targets as we were moving down and down and down. Um, and with that, quite simply, you have this environment where it's hard to imagine they have the ability to cap inflation on the upside, or at least hit an appropriate target on the upside. Uh, and so with that, you can see here, we're basically sitting right at this uh, this resistance, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring down uh, another, another channel line. This is just a very broad channel, which you can see is basically drawn off the top here back in 94, uh, which is that first kind of panic. Uh, but you can see here, we've, we've recently broken out and potentially used this as resistance. Now, uh, I bring this out because Bill Gross is kind of calling this area a bit of a tipping point. Um, this, this is basically 2.6 to 2.7 yield, uh, 2.6 to 2.7 on the 10-year yield. You break out there, quite simply, while it's, it's hard to make a, a bold call like this, well, it's easy to make the call. It's hard to have everything follow through. Um, he is seeing it as basically the beginning of the end of this monster, monster, again, bear market in yields, bull market in, in, in rates, uh, which, as you can imagine, are going to be inverse of this. Uh, and so if we can get that break higher, in yields, again, rates are breaking down, uh, then, then it has that potential to basically set up a pretty aggressive move higher, which again, aligns with what DB was saying with the Bund futures, um, and quite simply could show that it, it, is gonna get a it is gonna get a bit hairy, <laughs> so to speak, in terms of uh, what the Fed is gonna be able to do, uh, how aggressive they're gonna have to be, and that could, again, provide some further support for some of these, from the, for some of these major currencies. Um, another one, just for what it's worth, so I can bring it up. Take out the weekly chart. Uh, naturally, with with uh, uh, Marcon and Le Pen, and, and quite simply the elections that are coming up, uh, this is another one that's that's being watched. Um, it's it's one that again seems to be helping support quite simply the euro. Um, it, as, as we look at, again, sell-off in rates, rally in yields, uh, it seems to be opening up, whether it's you know, German bunds, uh, again, yields higher, that, that rate price down that DB was talking about, which is already happening on, that we're seeing on the continuation chart. Uh, you just hit, just hit year-to-date highs. You can see here basically sitting at this resistance. But, you know, the question is, could, could we get this move basically back to that 2015 high um, in uh, in in uh, in French yields, and this all seems to support that euro strength, which again might not be a euro dollar slam dunk, but it might be you identify that weak currency, and if yield stays supported in the eurozone, might offer up that potential for a nice setup or continuation trade for euro slash xxx xxx being whatever the whatever the weaker currency is. And in fact, I'm just going to throw a euro USD. I know again. I, USD is just the, the easy one to use. But one thing I would also say is that, you know, quite simply, if, uh, if Euro USD does start to move higher, it opens up that environment where, quite simply, DXY could move down, uh, and that could lead for Europe and, and possibly some yen strength to really start to take the lead. Uh, so, to me, those are some of the key things to look at with rates. We'll talk a little bit about some other some other components in just a moment. All right. So, oil, oil naturally uh, is a big player is a big player in the global inflation picture. Um, th the fundamentals of it is quite simply that while OPEC is cutting back production, which is helping to stabilize the market, uh, for, you know, it seems like the the 
the growth in supply in the U.S., which is a, a well-worn story, but the growth of supply in the U.S. basically based on you know, EMP companies that now have a lower cost of production. So they're able to be profitable, let's say, at $40 a barrel. So they're aggressively pumping at the current, at the current environment, uh, and it's, it's basically flooding the market again. Uh, in fact, we heard from, I think it was Kuwait this morning that said, okay, we might need to extend the cuts, which it's, it's difficult to say that the U.S. producers won't, <laughs> won't just continue to produce more. In fact, the uh, oil article I wrote, I think it was last Thursday, you know, first line was blame the Americans because it seems like that's what we're sitting at. I'm going to pull up the oil chart again. Take off the, overload, the overlaid price. So here's what I'm watching. So this is an Ichimoku chart. For those of you unfamiliar with Ichimoku, the quick and dirty version is that the cloud is a trend support. Um, whether it's uptrend or you know trend resistance in a downtrend, uh, oil has been very very sloppy. Uh, and 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 you know in fact one one view that uh, Jeremy Wagner, my colleague, who uh, really really likes to use Elliott Wave for every form of analysis, uh, says that we're, we're potentially looking at a long term what he calls a you know what's or what is known as a running triangle, uh, which means basically you have multiple months of sideways consolidation. Uh, so that that's helpful. Uh, if if you know we're seeing stability there, then that's likely going to put a floor under the inflation expectations. Naturally, that would also help some of the um, some of the compounding forces if you did get a breakout in yields. However, what I would note here uh, is that we have seen a move down below the 200 period moving average. I'm going to pull up the 200 period moving average and it's it's pretty unique on oil because the last few times we've gotten a punch below the 200 period moving average, it stayed there for about a day. Let me pull up a thicker line here. Okay, so you can see here that Basically, this 200 period moving average has been an excellent divider of biases in the oil market. So basically, b broke down in 2014, stayed down basically since here, since April of last year, so about a year ago. Uh, and then since then, anytime we've gone below the 200 period moving average, it's been a, it's been a pretty quick push higher. So I'm just going to draw these real quick. And as you can imagine, this opens up the view, what now? Are we going to see the same thing? Are we going to see this aggressive push higher? Right? Are we going to get this, this basically this, this aggressive bid uh, in the market uh, that, 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 that takes us, that takes whether the shorts are out, which again, as you can imagine, it's, it's, it's hard to get behind that view. Given the oversupply that you're going to get just this massive move higher uh, in, in oil. Um, all that being said, if we get this push down here, and we don't we don't see a move above the 200 period moving average, similar to what we've seen here, it could really hurt the confidence, rightfully so, of those bulls that are there. And there's a lot that are there as per as per uh, the COT data. So with that, that basically opens up this environment that it's important to keep an eye on what uh, what Jeremy Wagner was looking at. And I'm gonna again just kind of throw this here, um, throw up the expansion. Okay, so yeah, the, the 127 expansion right here, and basically we'd be looking for support if we did get a breakdown below this zone. We'd be looking for support here. If we don't catch that support, if we, so if we don't basically sit within the 618 of this prior range, uh, and, and we continue to break down, it's it's fair to argue that a lot of the damage, uh, a lot of the damage that was done in. 2014, 2015 could be repeated here because you again you have oversupply, you have rigs coming back on, you have basically a margin that's been reinstituted based on technological developments from these companies, but but if the oil breaks back down basically to 40 or sub 40, a lot of those companies that have really picked back up their production could be underwater again. So it, it's this important environment to watch because naturally it's going to affect commodity currencies, it's going to affect emerging markets, um, and and so. To me, yes, watch, you know, we, we basically broke below the 200-day moving average. For the last year, anytime we've broken below the 200-day moving average, uh, we've seen a pretty nice pop higher. Uh, if this doesn't hold, or basically we don't see that pop higher, then watch this 46 zone, uh, or excuse me, this 40, let's, let's call it 44 zone, 43.97, we'll round up to 44, uh, which again, just to, just to borrow a shortcut here, I'm going to take the extreme day range. right there, 
right? So if we get, if we get a breakdown below there, it could mean that we're not getting that. It means that we could we might not excuse me be getting that triangle, uh, and we could be seeing a stronger breakdown. Which again, and thank you, Chris, uh, on cue, <laughs> could align with what we're talking about here, which is quite simply that uh, this could have been a basically a, a corrective three wave move before an aggressive move higher, which also would align with dollar yen pushing higher. Uh, and, and as you can imagine, and this is where that macro mindset really comes into play, if in fact we are seeing a push higher in yields, that means that when these, you know, quite simply these energy companies have to roll over their debt, and that's, you know, the phrase zombie companies that was so popular um, over the last handful of years, is because companies are basically able to stay afloat with you know, declining revenues because they were able to borrow at basically zero uh, to, to to roll over their debt and to stay afloat. Right? As as that price starts to move higher, you could see a washout with unprofitable companies. And naturally, given the debt levels that are there, the oil sector, the energy sector in and of itself is going to be an important one to watch. So uh, you can see how these really start to all, all form around each other. Now, another one to absolutely keep an eye on that really aligns with oil here we are, uh, is metals. And with metals, quite simply, one that's been a poster child uh, post-election has been, has been iron ore. So let me pull up iron ore. And we're looking at the futures here. Uh, and, and right now things are well. In fact, this 88 zone has been has been incredibly important. Um, naturally, there's 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 been some pullback, which we see in any strong trend. Uh, but if this continues on, it, again, it could show that the, the the macro commodity picture continues to be encouraging, which again could help the emerging market equities uh, and, and and could keep could keep the sentiment going also would nicely align with yields and, and just because oil breaks down doesn't mean that we don't necessarily see a push higher in uh, in some of the metals in fact we're going to look at some ETFs next which could be showing quite simply that we continue to get we continue to get some of those uh, that positive sentiment developing and Chris hopefully that hopefully that answered what I'm keeping an eye on with dollar CAD um, also just from a technical perspective on dollar CAD and that 130, 131 zone, and that support has been so strong, it seems to favor that, again, whether a choppy or a extended move higher looks to be in play. That move below 130, I think, says uh, failure to move below 131, 130 uh, says a lot for dollar CAD. Uh, also, the BOC came out relatively hawkish last month, uh, which, which also put some damage in people expecting uh, either a strong cat on its own right, um, and we're definitely not getting it from the dollar given given the rate expectations. All right, so looking at ETFs, ETFs is, you know, uh, to me a lot of this is based on the work from John Murphy uh, in, in his book, Intermarket Analysis. Um, and, and his latest edition, which was required reading and I think the third level of the CNT, uh, he talked about util utilizing ETFs as a, as a, as a you know, valuable peak, so to speak, into global sentiment. So I want to take a look at some of the some of the more popular uh, sentiment defining uh, ETFs. Uh, so the first one is is, uh, is, the, is is the high yield index. Now again, this one is, is singing a little bit of a different tune. And as you can imagine, high yield starts to become a good deal less attractive in a raising rate environment. Raising rate raising rate environment, excuse me. It was a bit more attractive when you had a very accommodative Federal Reserve, very accommodative you know, global central bank environment. And that's because these companies that you know, were either fallen angels or whatever, uh, that were paying high yields, could roll over their debt rather cheaply. If again, you get bun yields breaking out, US yields breaking out, you do have that environment for uh, quite simply some defaults and that's gonna pull this down. So this to me is an important proxy to watch. It doesn't define the global risk picture, but it's an important one to watch because if we get a small pullback and then a breakdown, it could align with a rising rate picture, which again, could align with a stronger Euro, could align with a stronger Yen, stronger dollar, uh, but it could mean quite simply that you're gonna have to be a bit more careful. You're basically gonna have to go to the higher you know, the IG type of companies, uh, investment grade, not not, uh, not IG the broker, but uh, investment grade type of companies, which could basically pull back that view favoring Dow companies versus Russell companies. Uh, let's go to another one, which is really another, you know, kind of, uh, I named it a poster child, which is EEM. Uh, and, and just another one uh, is quite simply, let me pull up. 
EFA, uh, these are basically international markets, all right? So EEM uh, has done very, very well basically on that inflation look. Um, EFA, which is what I have up now, as you can see here, seems to be breaking above basically prior resistance, seems to be showing a nice rally mode. This is foreign equity. So this is one, though we have that, what looks to be the potential for a breakdown in oil, and I gave you some levels to look at, if we get that breakout here, it's going to be difficult to come out and say the world's coming to an end. I, again, I think you have an environment where with yields pushing higher, it's going to take a lot to break the story of, of, of positive sentiment and positive stories. Uh, and that's that's something we've seen over time, right, is that you know the, the environment, the story, if you will, builds on itself, right? And so it takes a lot for that to break. Um, Break is a, pre is, is a rather harsh term, but I'll say these could continue to build on each other, which I think would favor higher equities, which you know, we'll, we'll touch on a little bit. But you know, specifically, um, you know, FTSE 250 is one in particular because of the weak pound. Uh, but DAX, Nikkei has recently broken out in a way that we haven't seen in a while, uh, and could and could continue higher. Uh, and and so, it, it, given the foreign equity. ETF, which EFA and EEM were the two that I pulled out, uh, that could be showing just quite simply a, a pretty bullish global sentiment picture. Uh, and you know, in terms of commodities, uh, while you look at the base metals index, which again another ETF that seems to be doing rather well. It's doing definitely better than like the precious metals index, uh, the energy index, right? So that's the energy that's the energy fund ETF. Right, so and again, base metals is 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 a fascinating one. It, it also one of the ones that I like to take a look at. Again, there we are. The timber ETF, right? So that that's that's one that really aligns with what we're seeing with the base metals, which is again choppy but a, a defined uptrend. And and so with that does show, I think that that bullish momentum, which also in my opinion aligns with where the Fed is looking and with higher yields. Um, let me just go to some bond ETFs. I think those are those are often helpful. Uh, and these are price based. So this is what DB was talking about. Uh, you look at the continuation charts. You're seeing those breakdowns. This favors higher yields. So this is basically the belly. Uh, seven to ten. Uh, these are rate prices again, so inverse to yield. So a breakdown here would favor higher in uh, higher U.S. yields. TLT looks very, very, very similar. And I already talked a little bit about HYG uh, in the same manner of uh, JNK. If you do get those higher rates or that lower that lower rates price, that could kind of Wipe out some of that uh, the weaker the weaker uh, participants in the in the credit market. All right, so with that, we talked about rates, we talked about commodities. Just taking a look at FX, and I've naturally been weaving FX in and out of this all day long. But uh, we are sitting right now with euro as the stalwart. Uh, euro is positioned, I think, best against those weaker currencies, which uh, another thing worth noting, and I like to also take a look at, which is in the options market, specifically the um, the uh, one month 25 delta risk reversals, which quite simply show you, you know, is a premium being paid for out of the money calls or out of the money puts? Uh, and, and the out of the money calls that are getting the highest premium right now are uh, dollar knock, dollar sec, dollar CAD, which is basically, you know, as you can see, it's basically people paying for downside protection of commodity currencies and scandies. Um, upside, downside protection that's getting purchased, so put premiums, uh, you're seeing CAD, yen, um, you know, it, it, Yen crosses tend to get a bit of a premium there, uh, just just because they they act as insurance as is. Uh, but I think it's I think it's helpful to take a look and see uh, and see where are where are the the premiums being paid. And again, just right now, you look in the options market. Dollar sec again, dollar cad, dollar knock. Mentioned those Danish krona as well. Euro pound also has some upside protection. We talked about euro pound being potentially attractive on the upside. And again, downside. Uh, if you if you remove the yen bias, uh, then you also see uh, Kiwi dollar and Aussie dollar downside protection receiving a premium. Which of those two, those those could be pretty fascinating. Again, Aussie right now it's basically middle of the road. It was a rather strong currency. It's middle of the road now. Uh, Kiwi weakest currency. Uh, and that's going to be a fascinating to watch. Uh, fascinating one to watch. 
we talked a bit about this. I mean, just this aggressive move higher. Um, the question is, you know, is the is the upside continuation there at the moment? Uh, to me, this is worth watching a pullback and, and potentially getting in on a pullback. It's not a trade recommendation for myself, Daily FX or IG, uh, but it's it's interesting because. Basically, institutions are saying, you know, we've, we've, we've stretched too much. We could see a pullback in the key or, a, you know, a, a push higher in the Kiwi based on this, this ex excessive sell-off. However, depending, depending on what we see in some of the commodity markets, some, you know, some of the external financing, uh, which, which, again, higher yields could affect that, could affect some of that trade, uh, you could see further pain to New Zealand. Um, Aussie dollar, let me just go to Aussie dollar real quick. Uh, this to me is going to be a more difficult one to, to get behind. I understand paying for the downside protection, um, which is again what we're seeing in the one month 25 delta risk reversal market. But net net, I think, which has been DB's call all along, uh, that Aussie Kiwi upside or Kiwi downside uh, is, is likely the cleaner play. Though we do have a lot of data on both fronts this week. Had tip, had tip DB there. <laughs> so what are some of the uh, the March trades worth watching from here? Uh, naturally, again, keeping an eye on DXY. Uh, DXY has been on that uh, that long term uptrend. Just pull that back up. Yeah, you know, so we're basically sitting at cloud support there, also holding this uh, long term Anders pitchfork. For those of you wondering why why is this drawn this way? Uh, I like to look for basically a momentum low or a momentum closing low and, and draw the handle off the close and then pull pivots from that. So that's that's what you're looking at there with the pitchfork. Um, the other the other one I think worth keeping an eye on, uh, we looked at the iron ore futures. See if that continues to push higher. If we can break above 88, that could be a rather bullish sign, which would likely affect positively EFA and some of those international equities. Euro USD and, and really it's it's not Euro USD because again if you remember that slide from earlier basically you have Euro USD as uh, the two strongest currencies so those are going to go back and forth but really just just Euro as a whole keep a good eye there uh, naturally I think given the eventual release of Article 50 um, later this month. This is going to be an important one to watch. It looks triangulating now, so you naturally want to wait for a breakout to develop. But uh, I think looking for some of those weaker currencies. Uh, again, I had an uh, analyst pick on Euro Kiwi. I think Jeremy Wagner had one. Oh, I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, Jeremy Wagner had one on Euro CAD. So ones to watch again, especially if uh, those Euro yields continue to break. Uh, and then with with WTI. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but it's worth going back. Uh, this lagging line here, this this to me is so important to watch. This is that momentum component. Now, if this is a triangle, Ichimoku basically becomes worthless because it just means that we're, we're basically eating up time, not as much price. Uh, and so with that, and you, we've seen price on either side of the cloud. The cloud's not really acting as strong support. So if this is a triangle, which we'd be looking really at 44 as that long-term triangle support, uh, but if this is a triangle, then we could just continue on sideways uh, and, and quite simply let the demand uh, the demand and oversupply picture play out as other base metal currents or base metal commodities continue to rally. Uh, but all that being said, if we do in fact get a breakdown, i.e. break below 44, I'm going to pull Ichimoku back up. And lagging line takes us really cleanly below this zone because you can see here we've gotten peaks below the 200 day moving average, momentum line peaks below the cloud, and then a strong reversal up. If we don't get that, that would seem to, again, to Chris's question earlier, seem to favor a further breakdown in oil, which would favor further upside in further upside in uh, dollar CAD. So these are kind of the charts to leave you guys with on the macro mindset. So this is this is the ETF for the euro, um, the currency shares euro. So uh, FXE again. Wh why am I showing you this? In fact, let me show you. Let me redraw this because you can see FXE. I think this was drawn on a weekly and then pulled down. So what's what's interesting to me about this is what you can see is that we're basically sitting in this top quartile of this channel here. I'm just going to zoom in here because if we do get that breakout, again, euro dollar might not be the trade, but euro strength could be could be a, a rather compelling story to watch. Uh, the other one, again, I, I showed this to you guys earlier. This is that uh, this is that uh, uh, TNX from earlier. So the TNX is basically uh, just showing you the 10-year 10 10 year yield. If we get a breakout above there, 
then again, that would give us that tipping point that Bill Gross is looking at, uh, but, but could quite simply knock out JNK as well as uh, as as well as other quite simply debt laden companies. Uh, so again, that that macro mindset, I think it's building up a rather compelling picture, and so to me, it's going to be one to keep an eye on because if this does break out, uh, it's going to put the the Fed in a corner, and we could absolutely start talking four hikes in 2014, 2017, excuse me, <laughs> four hikes in 2017, um, and, and again, that's going to have ramifications of its own. The, the one chart that I've been watching, we don't talk a lot about because it's an institutional market, uh, but it's the Euro dollar, so actually talking about Euro dollar futures, which is basically one minus LIBOR. Um, this, this headline has been coming up quite a few quite a few times over the last week, which is that institutions have a short, a record short exposure on Euro dollar futures. Uh, and just for those, again, for those of you that aren't comfortable reading this, it's one minus LIBOR. So basically, the closer you get to par, the closer you get to 100, the lower the lower LIBOR is, or the lower the US rate is. Uh, there's tens of trillions of dollars priced off of this. So this, as you can imagine, all works into what we're talking about with high yields uh, and potentially down the road negative effects for these deadweight companies that have been borrowing at zero to stay afloat, uh, which again leads to its own leads to its own um, sentiment component. But if we do get a breakdown here, and just you know you can read this uh, basically after the top in 2000, right? Greenspan and Co started cutting rates, um, you know, and then started raising rates here. You had the credit crisis. Now Bernanke came on in 2006, started cutting rates, so we get closer to one, uh, basically stayed flat here, and now the market's starting to price in, and again, record short exposure. So given that there's tens of trillions of dollars priced off of priced off of LIBOR, and that's basically what Euro dollar futures are showing you. EDA is, um, or ED1 is what you can look at on TradingView, uh, but if that continues to break down, then a lot of that pressure that we've been talking about could really be building up. So this is this is absolutely one to watch. Uh, this is in the running, <laughs> if you will, for the most compelling chart for me. Which brings us to our conclusion, which is quite simply that you know you look at global risk, uh, and and there are cracks, so to speak. But net net, global risk seems to be supported. Uh, whether you look at base metals, whether you look at timber, uh, whether you look at foreign equities, it it seems too early to get in get in on that. Uh, you know, equity markets have topped view. Um, one one thing that I would show, and excuse me, I should say rising yields, falling rates. Uh, one thing that I would show here, quite simply, is is that there is, I think, going to be that divergence between the smaller, weaker companies and the stronger. You know, firms that have 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 strong capital budgeting. Uh, let me go over to equities real quick, because uh, again, we took a we took a quick look at uh, the Nikkei, which seems to be rather well supported. A couple other ones that are looking good: Euro stocks 50, obviously the DAX. Uh, what makes the 250 interesting? The FTSE 250 interesting, which you might just be able to get that on the terminal. That I could get that here, uh, but is it quite simply again? You, you've got a bit of a, of a of a currency war victory, so to speak. Uh, currency war victory, so to speak, with that with that weak pound. Uh, but look over week over week strength. FTSE 250 has definitely been one that's up there with Nikkei and the SX 5E. Um, pull up the DAX as well. Not not as steep of a slope, but still a positive trend there. So uh, with that, to me. In the FX realm, keep an eye on euro. Keep an eye again on on commodities, specifically uh, the Scandies as well as the CAD, especially if oil does do a further breakdown. Um, and then, actually, given everything that's going on this week, believe it or not, we I don't think we expect where rates are now, where the Fed is expected to be now. I don't think we expect a lot of aggressive moves in the dollar. Um, it's gonna. I think it's gonna take more action from from the rates market to see that happen. Uh, however, of course, keep an eye on real-time news for daily effects. Uh, we'll be updating throughout the week. So uh, with that, I want to thank you guys for your time. Uh, this was, again, kind of an action-packed webinar. Uh, and 
for what it's worth, DB, thank you for uh, the input and everybody else appreciate the, the, the questions as well as the input. Anybody has any questions, do not hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, this was recorded, so I'll be shooting you guys an email uh, with the recording as well as the slides. So again, that way you could basically look through them. Uh, again, just to share with you again my hack uh, on YouTube when you do the replay, fast forward it, do it like 1.5 or 1.7, uh, though I might be on Chickmunk chipmunk mode, you know, it allows you to take back in the information at a, at a faster pace. And since you've already listened to it once, uh, or if it is your first time, you know, it, it, quite simply, I think it, I think it sinks a little bit further. So uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have questions about what was shared. Um, definitely look forward to, to, to seeing what's going on in the rates market. Because, you know, to me, I think going forward, and, and, and you look at what's allowed some of the, some of the themes to extend, you know, whether it's unicorn companies, whatever you want to call it, a lot of it's been the low rate environment. And so as that really starts to get jolted, uh, we're likely looking at a different economic future, good, bad, or indifferent. So keep an eye on rates. Uh, I absolutely will, and I'll be back next Monday to talk about it as well. Have a great day, guys.